my mental reminder to do that. Um, and this video will be available on the CTE NYC YouTube channel after the event. So if you have any colleagues or um, staff at the school who would like to watch this after the fact, by all means, please feel free to share it with them. And I'm going to be emailing you um, the link to that after the event. Okay. Um, all right. So let's see. I think we got everybody in. Let me just make sure. A couple more folks. Um, and please, if you'd like, in the meantime, we would love if you would introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, if you're a student, please just say your name and what school you're from. If you feel like saying what CTE program you're in, that would be great too. And if you're a teacher or a school administrator, please also introduce yourself. We'd love to know who's joining us today. Yay, Chelsea High School. Arbor School, awesome, Bayside. Great. Lots of Harbor School. Hi, I am MD, I like school, that's awesome. Okay. All right, I think we got everyone, oh, a couple more. All right, so I guess we'll get started. Um, so welcome, uh, my name is Corinne Derone. I'm here from the New York City Department of Education's Career and Technical Education Department. Um, I support a number of schools um, that have CTE programs, and I have two colleagues like myself who support a variety of um, programs in CTE. We have eight industry sectors, and um, we've invited a bunch of you today to join us so that you can learn about careers, um, specifically in advanced manufacturing, um, and there are a, um, a large number of jobs available in advanced manufacturing, particularly in New York City. Um, so we've partnered with um, New York City Small Business Services um, to bring to you today two really exciting businesses. We have Makerspace NYC and Nanobiotics joining us to talk about what they do in advanced manufacturing, to talk about the kind of jobs that you could have in advanced manufacturing businesses. Um, and we really welcome you to ask questions today. Um, we'd like you to stay on mute um, during the presentation portions of today's event. Um, but when we get to the Q&A portion, which we'll have two of after each presentation, um, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, or if you'd like, you can also just uh, drop your question in the chat. Um, and I would encourage you to just drop your questions in the chat throughout today's presentation so that when we get to the Q&A portion, I could kind of revisit the chat and just pull up those questions because sometimes I know questions pop into your head as someone's talking or as you're seeing something and then you forget, you know, when the Q&A comes around. Um, so feel free to put your questions in the chat throughout and we'll, we'll get to all of you, um, hopefully. Um, and so with that, I'd like to introduce Neil Paducone. Neil, forgive me if I'm totally mispronouncing your, your last name there, um, from New York City Small Business Services. Thank you, Corinne. Hi, everybody. Um, looks like we have a really good turnout today. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. As Corinne mentioned, my name is Neil Patacone. Um, I'm director of the Manufacturing and Industrial Innovation Council at the City, City of New York's uh, Department of Small Business Services. Um, we're, a, we, we're a part of city government, and we work with uh, companies across the industrial sector um, to help them with uh talent and workforce development issues hiring training their folks uh with policy and regulatory issues if there's um if there's you know anything the city's doing that's either helping or hurting we kind of help them fix that and with technology and innovation um so just a quick overview of what we're up to today um i'm going to be providing a very brief introduction to industrial and to advanced manufacturing specifically um, then we're going to have Dominique and her team from Nanotronics share a little bit about what they're up to, and you'll take a, sh a brief video tour of their facility, uh, see, see how, how everything that they're describing happens um, in, in, in real life, 
Uh, and you can throw in some questions either in the chat when you when they come up to you or um, after their presentation. Um, we'll take some Q and A about you know uh, what kinds of technologies they work with, um, what kinds of products they make, what what kinds of skills you would need um, to get a job there if that's of interest. Um, and then once Nanotronics wraps up, we're going to invite Scott Van Campen, who runs Makerspace NYC, to share a little bit about um, Makerspace. And uh, similarly, you will take a video tour of um, the facility, see the facilities, see the shop, see some of the machines, see some of the technologies and capabilities. And, um, and uh, you'll be able to ask Scott some questions about, um, oh, what's that machine? What does that do? Uh, I don't really understand what just happened. <laughs> Um, can you tell, tell me a little more about that so uh, and how to get involved and then finally we'll wrap up with um, a program that we at the Department of Small Business Services run called Apprentice NYC um, where you'll actually you can receive training um, paid training in a lot of these technologies so uh, stay tuned uh, just as a background to where I sit, as I mentioned, Manufacturing and Industrial Innovation Council, or MAKE, um, we, as I mentioned, work on work with businesses across the industrial sector on talent, um, hiring, technology, innovation, policy, and also just getting folks together and organizing the industry. Um, we are led by an executive board of about 18 different industrial companies. And we have three advisory committees to, uh, focusing on these issues and um, welcome your participation if this is something that is of interest to you. Um, before we really jump into this, though, help me out, please. Uh, put this in the chat. Uh, what comes to mind when you hear the words manufacturing and industrial? Whatever it is, just throw it in the chat. Factory, yeah, mass production. Building, high-end equipment and parts, factories, mass production, innovation. Great, very intelligent workers, excellent. Machinery, production, money, that's a good one. <laughs> Steel, tools, making something yourself off of your engineering idea. That's a great, that's a great point, engineering. Excellent, cool, thank you. So yeah, what, what, um, what we mean when we use the word industrial is everything across these sectors, manufacturing and production of anything. Um, everything from food to metals to medical equipment uh, to garments. Uh, we're also talking about transportation, logistics and distribution, uh, getting things from point A to point B, uh, getting people from point A to point B, infrastructure services, waste management and utilities, um, the folks that maintain and build uh, bridges and streets, and of course, building and construction, building houses, building infrastructure. Um, and this actually really surprised me. Even today, you know, you think of New York as a, as a city of skyscrapers and, and, and stores, but there's over 500,000 jobs in the industrial sector in New York City. Um, and this was actually right before COVID, but it might actually be a little higher today. Um, and you know that's higher. That's that's more jobs in the industrial sector than there are in uh, real estate, in finance, um, even in digital tech. And you know a lot of the jobs in government in this bracket here are also industrial jobs. You know, working for the MTA, um, working for the Department of, of uh, Environmental Protection. A lot of those are industrial jobs as well. And so a lot of this. So even more than that, five hundred thousand. And one of the reasons that industrial has been such an important part of our economy is that average industrial wages are actually more than twice the average wage of what you'd get if you're working in a retail space or in hospitality. Um, and, 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 and this is just comparing a couple of industries that don't always require college certifications. Um, but if you do, of course, you know that, that your, your wage number um, can, can even go up. And finally, you know, skill building. Um, 
most jobs in the industrial sector don't necessarily require formal college education um, because you can build transferable skills on the job while getting paid. Um, like I said, you you know you, you you start off even better if you've got some 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 certifications and engineering chops. Um, but it's still a skill building career that can lead to entrepreneurship. Um, you learn on the job for for years, and then you, you understand the machinery, you understand the industry, and you know how to make something that the industry needs. And so you can kind of spin off and, um, and create your own business that way. And most of these jobs are highly, highly specialized, highly skilled, uh, but, and most importantly, applied, right? This is the application of scientific design, technical, sometimes chemical, very often digital, and that's what we're gonna talk about today engineering and operational knowledge in most industrial processes. So what is New York, what is industrial look like specifically in New York City? We spoke a bit about how about the jobs, uh, wages and and wealth development um, and how so many of these services and activities are really essential to just the basic functioning of of our city of New York. But it's also the industrial sector is also the backbone of the city's food supply. Uh, whether you're manufacturing food, whether you're distributing food, whether you're keeping it cold and safe. Um, it's a fundamental component of innovation, as somebody said in the chat. Uh, and we'll learn a little bit about how these really, these two really interesting companies that we have um, as our as our tour, uh, tour hosts today are going to be sharing um, how they use uh, physical technology to innovate. Um, it's essential to housing development support. You need a place to live. Um, people need to build it. Build it. People need to maintain it. That's all industrial. It is vital to the response to climate change. Everything from, you know, upgrading uh, car vehicles to electric, or um, building and assembling wind turbines, or installing solar panels. Um, all in this realm, and. We talk a lot, you hear a lot about automation, right? And, and the transition to, from, from jo of jobs to automation and the industrial sector and particularly companies like the ones we're gonna be hearing from today are really at the cutting edge of that, making sure that, that skills and jobs are transitioning to automation rather than being, um, rather than being kind of displaced. Um, and so just a couple of examples, during COVID, a lot of industrial firms were absolutely pivotal to supplying the response and retaining the city's economic security. You had hardware manufacturers, including two of the, the two companies here today, um, pivoting some of their operations to provide uh, personal protective equipment to healthcare facilities and people. You had garment manufacturers that were pivoting to provide isolation gowns uh, to hospitals. You had technology manufacturers uh, producing ventilators, technology manufacturers that were usually producing communication systems for the, the MTA, for example, pivoted to create ventilators because they, they were able to innovate in just the same way that um, the folks in the chat were saying. So many things, um, so many of these businesses have been essential um, to our maintenance every day, but particularly during COVID. A couple of the challenges uh, that the sector faces, um, one is, is just real estate, everything right in New York is, is um, it's tough to find an affordable space, the same goes for industrial, um, particularly as, as neighborhoods start to change right. Um, places like Williamsburg in, um, in Brooklyn uh, used to be much more heavily industrial and that now it's a lot more residential even places like Jerome Avenue in the Bronx. Um, those things are changing. But the other two challenges we, that are actually really opportunities um, that we want to talk about today are even with a post COVID rebound manufacturers are still finding still finding it trouble to hire people. Um, just last year, they said that over two and 2.1 million manufacturing jobs in the US might go unfilled um, and that's not even including the ones that are getting filled. Um, so a tremendous amount of, of employment opportunities in the US today, um, particularly as the older generation of, of manufacturing talent has been um, retiring. Um, and that intersects with this third piece that 
businesses really need to transition. They need to become a lot more tech savvy um, and, and utilize advanced manufacturing and advanced uh, industrial processes and technologies, um, not if they want to be competitive and also if they want to uh, stay, stay alive as businesses and, and to hire the next wave of talent. Um, and this is really where these two things intersect that we're going to be talking about today in advanced manufacturing. Um, a lot of these jobs um, are going to be advanced. They're going to be utilizing advanced technologies. And so I was actually surprised that um, nobody in the chat mentioned, you know, an image that looks like this, these 1950s. A lot of people, when they think about manufacturing, they think about these 1950s images. Um, but the reality is, with advanced manufacturing, we're using innovative technologies to improve uh, both the products that are made as well as the processes. And just to list a couple of technologies that are being integrated into the way that industrial companies, including manufacturers, are operating these days, computer assisted technologies, right? Computer assisted design, um, CAD, CAE, high performance computing for modeling simulation before you actually create something you want to make sure you want to you want to kick the tires of it in a model uh, before you actually you know waste money um, building it waste money and resources rapid prototyping you can use technologies like 3d printing or additive manufacturing where you design something on a computer and um, I know Scott's going to share a little bit about how this works um, but uh, just sort of building an entire piece of, of you know, whatever it is that you've designed um, right there. High precision technologies, getting to, uh, and I think this might be the, uh, the, the source of one of our company's names, getting to the nanoscale precision um, of, of being able to cut metal um, or cut any material really, so that you can really, really get into the details of it information technologies using smart machines, cloud computing, and of course, automation, right? Robotics, artificial intelligence, and even augmented reality. A lot of uh, companies are using AR, autom augmented reality, to assist in training. Um, and even what, what companies are calling digital twins, where you don't even have to be in a facility, but you have an entire electronic map of your factory that you can look at from somewhere else in the world. Um, like we mentioned, sustainable and green processes, waste reduction, energy efficiency, advanced materials, combining things, combining raw materials that used to never exist in order to save money, um, to, save, to save waste, and of course, the application of data analytics. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, Dominique and her team from Nanotronics to share a little bit about their company. And uh, then we'll take a short tour. Thanks, Dominique. Welcome. Thanks, Neil. Everyone, hi, nice to meet you. I'm Dominique. I'm the Director of Community Engagement here. I'm here with Gabe. He's our Director of Manufacturing. Um, so Nanotronics, just a little bit about us before you get into the tour. Um, we're a science and tech company, and we basically use optics, robotics, and AI to basically work within aerospace, automotive, genomics, healthcare, and electronics. Um, and basically what we do is we detect flaws and anomalies in manufacturing on a nano scale. So like basically smart microscopes um, <laughs> and we build the, manufa we manufacture the hardware and the software here. Um, so we have a new facility. Um, this is where you're gonna be seeing our video from and it's 45,000 square feet. And we're expected to bring in about 190 jobs by 2026. So our, a little bit about like what Corinne was um, speaking about as far as with jobs. We do have a lot of jobs and positions that need to be filled all the way from like HR to manufacturing and working with Gabe. So it's um, from the admin side all the way up until uh, manufacturing. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video and whatever questions you have, uh, please let us know. Thanks, Tommy. Can everybody see uh, this, this video file that says nanotronics? Great, and if you um, cannot hear me, please, ping, uh, please let me know. Welcome to Nanotronics. We're a science and technology company located at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. We're here at the Center of Manufacturing and Workforce Innovation along Brooklyn's waterfront. There are over 500 businesses 
and over 11,000 people located across 300 acres. This has become a great space for us to foster growth and include the ongoing development of manufacturing anchoring the industrial sector. At Nanotronics, we use optics, robotics, AI, and software engineering to lay the foundation for the fourth industrial revolution across aerospace, automotive, genomics, electronics, healthcare, and others to assist human ingenuity in detecting flaws and anomalies in manufacturing. Recently, we celebrated the opening of our new flagship manufacturing center located in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Our new center is expected to generate $33.5 million for the state and city government and create 190 <coughs> jobs by 2026. We pride ourselves in being a key player to solidify New York's role as a global center of the innovation economy. With offices in Ohio, California, and New York, our new 45,000 square foot building serves as our headquarters. Manufacturing hardware and software no, no. capable of working at a nanometer scale, our facility houses computer scientists, chemists, and physicists who work directly with skilled machinists on the manufacturing floor, developing innovations that continue to lead partner industries to a smaller factory footprint, less waste, and a faster route from R&D to production. We are thrilled to advance manufacturing with the perspective of seeing our past, looking out of our windows at the city where so much of our present is on view and build an intelligent factory where robotics, AI, and humans can work together to create a sustainable future, contributing to quality jobs for the community and supporting economic growth for New York City. Amazing. Thank you, Karen. Uh, uh, Dominique, excuse me. <laughs> um, any questions? If not, I'm, I've got a ton of questions, um, but would love to hear from, from folks. Uh, please throw your, throw your questions in the chat. All right, I'll kick it off. Um, how, let's see. Can you walk us through a little bit, um, kind of a life cycle of a product that you might work with? Um, what's what's something that we might have heard of um, that you work with, or or like a piece of a, of a technology that that we might have heard of that you work with? Uh, yeah. So you guys use your phones. Um, a lot of the things that we inspect um, go into what makes this. Um, also, like, let's see, your dishwasher, it could be, it could be anything, like I said, from healthcare to electronics, um, genomics, and automotive, especially, um, and semiconductor industry. So, like, we're really big within that. We can't really say our customers, but we can tell you. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> and so, when a product comes to you, is it already... Um, is it already made or, and then you, you guys do the testing or is there, are there additional components there? So sometimes it's already made, but a lot of times like we'll, so what we do is we'll inspect their, like their wafers, their semiconductors. So we'll see like what the, if they have any dust or if they have a speck or if they have like a cut that they want to manufacture and put out, we'll find the defect in that before it can be, it can be done. So sometimes we'll like, literally make and create what they need like we'll create our tool to inspect the things that they need so it doesn't it's not just like a one size fit all type of thing it sometimes it's like very specified and detailed towards the customer it's cool we got a handful of questions coming in in the chat here so i'm just going to jump to some of them um what products might nanotech be able to differentiate is it just detecting flaws or do you use it to build certain things well, we just, right here, we detect the flaws and anomalies in manufacturing in the process. So like any type of, like I said, any type of flaw before you put something out at scale, we'll literally find like what a problem is. Um, so like, let's say 
someone was about to create a bunch of cell phones and there was a problem within, I don't know, there was a problem within like their semiconductor before they shipped it out. We're able to literally see that problem before, <clears throat> excuse me, before we send it out. Okay. Um, what are some achievements that nanotech has been able to make before compared to before um, it existed? Um, and how has it nanotech made a difference in our society so far? Well, I think with like nanotech, sure, it's able to see things on a smaller scale. Um, you're able to have a lot of advances in healthcare. Um, that's a big thing that's happening. Um, <clears throat> with us, like I said, we just focus on like the manufacturing side. So we're not really as far as like nanotech, we're not building anything here um, except for our microscopes. Um, so that's what we focused on. Um, we also build the inhale machine, as you were mentioning before, as far as like healthcare and what we did to kind of like switch that. We um, started a, it's a CPAP and a BiPAP machine that we are able to, that we created basically when COVID was really hitting every, everywhere hard. There's a question here that I want to kind of riff off of. Um, Sajdeep asked, are there multiple processes that products go into based on their use and type? And I want to kind of relate it to the, um, the CPAP type machine you developed. That's not something you normally did, right? No. But you just had these capabilities, different types of capabilities that you were sort of able to, that you knew very well, but you were able to mix and match them um, to produce this new technology that, that wound up saving people's lives. How did, how did that kind of reconfiguration of what you do day to day on, you know, iPhone components, um, how, how did you translate that to a, a, a ventilator type device? Well, a uh, reading so device. it started with our uh, president of the company, John Putman. Um, that's Matthew, our CEO's father. He uh, saw a need um, because a lot of people didn't have access to uh, machining to just help them breathe during COVID. And um, at the time, Matthew had COVID and it was a big thing. So it just came out of a need. Um, we saw, you know, a lot of it was really cost effective. So it was something that we made that was smaller. Um, it was more compact and it was able to do the job and prevent a lot of the innovation that we saw was happening. Um, it was completely different from what we knew, but we did work with the uh, STEAM Center, the, the, the kids over at the STEAM Center to help build. And it was our first um, product we we're working on inside this building. Amazing. Um, so a more technical question from a student, does Nanotronics use a cloud provider for running their machine learning workloads? I believe we do. Yes, we yeah. do. Um, <laughs> we have a couple different types that we use. With our CAD CAM software, uh, we use a Fusion 360, which has a basis. It's based on a cloud type of providing. And then also we have an internal um, networking that allows us to share with our other facilities in California. Let's see. Um... What's a good degree to get a job in this field? And yeah, how do folks find a job in, at, in nanotech? <laughs> yeah, a lot of times we'll find engineering degrees. Um, so like mechanical engineering, um, engineering. Um, what else? Honestly, sometimes, sometimes not know. even any type of degree. <laughs> if you have a strong need or mechanically inclined in the industry, I mean, there's always a place to start out. And again, even to touch back on that too, like with HR, you know, we still need admin. It's still a, a business. So finance, uh, you know, there's a lot of different parts that you can go in. Right. Even in manufacturing and industrial firms, there's the operational side, but there's well, within the operational side, there's there's production, there's quality control, there's, you know, all these different pieces, but then step out of the operational side and there's, you know, logistics of how do you get pieces in and out? How do you manage um, the accounts, make sure that the, the, the money works? Um, how do HR, do, you know, are the, are the, are the are, is your workforce getting what it needs to do what, do the work they need to do? So many different components and that's just within a single company. It's a really good point, um, Dominique. Um, in what ways 
is robotics or AI implemented in detecting certain, certain anomalies? So what we do is we have our robotic arm um, and it, it's a loader, so it's an automatic loader. So it loads the wafers and um, we're able to basically do continuous scanning um, onto like to see, basically point out this. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Um, let's see, here's an interesting question. What are some entry level roles at your job and would there be hands-on work? If so, what types of hands-on work is there to vary from? Well, we actually have quite a few different types of entry level positions. Um, starting off, we have like in our machine shop, we'll have like a CNC apprentice, which is someone that like the qualifications for it is somebody that just has kind of mechanically inclined and someone that wants to pursue a career in either a mechanical engineering or in manufacturing in general. And that is definitely hands-on. Um, you're gonna learn everything from like basic, how to operate hand tools all the way up into how to operate heavy equipment. And then on the assembly side of the house, we do have a technical assembler, which learns on a little bit um, basic, like introduction to electrical. Um, they do a lot of like different types of soldering jobs and how to actually put together a product. So again, somebody that's mechanically inclined and prefer if you have like a basic understanding of electricity. Let's see, um, two questions about Nanotronics itself. What, what would you say makes Nanotronics stand out as opposed to other companies? And are Nanotronics expensive? If so, how do you guys manage to work with it? Uh, so something that I think helps us to stand out is our team. Um, we really pride ourselves in the way that we're able to communicate with our team and, you know, get the job done. We do things on a, you know, a smaller scale. So our, our biggest thing is factory, you know, making sure that it goes from R&D to production, um, giving a smaller factory footprint and creating less waste. Um, so those are like the, th the three things that we pride ourselves on. As far as you said expensive with me, I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat that part of the question? Is, our, our, is working with nanotronics and, and nano level uh, technologies expensive? Um, how does the company kind of make that work? <laughs> yeah, uh, for the most part, it usually is. Um, we're able to, I guess, I don't know if that's a selling question. Um, it feels like, but it, um, we're able to kind of lower our prices than the normal one. <laughs> Normal. Yeah, that might be a, a more sort of business yeah. operation side that uh, you need to work at, at nanotronics to really understand specifically. <laughs> um, let's see, what would an average salary be for somebody who works in the nanotronics field um, or nanotechnology field more broadly? So that can vary. It's a, it, it really depends. Um, it depends on the level of skill. It depends on the job. Uh, but we do start our interns off at twenty dollars an hour, um, so they're able to learn on the job as well as you know really get some create. You know they're able to create and feel like they're a part of something bigger than themselves, which is really good. And they learn a lot from each each um, each department, from QA to machining to um, like you said operation. Um, so that's really a great opportunity for a lot of students. Yeah, with so many different components, how can you, you can't walk the, walk through the place without learning something? Right, right. Um, <laughs> amazing. I don't know if you see these questions coming in. Where can I sign up? Uh, 15 different questions coming in. Where can I sign up for that entrant position? Well, you can go onto the nanotronics.co um, and see if you're able, if you qualify for any of those positions. <laughs> you got a lot of interest here. <laughs> <laughs> Nanotronics.co, yes. <laughs> um, We're always accepting new new talent. So please apply, apply, apply. Amazing. Um, <laughs> let's say a, a rung above this the interns, what are what are entry level roles look like? Or or is that where people would get started? Um, you know, it's, it's, we've had a lot of people actually start off as interns. Um, 
and really rise to the occasion. So it's it's really good to see how we can work with a student. And you know, a semester, we may take a semester off, but it's like a whole full experience for them. So it's really nice and we get to be a part of that. Um, they can definitely start off as interns. Sometimes they come in already prepared as uh, engineers or QA, um, mechanical engineers, uh, CNCs. But a lot of times we just, we love to start with an intern and really watch their career and help that with Man, you're mentioning that cash money really, uh, <laughs> really sparked some interest over here. Uh, we got a more meta question. As the world starts to get more digital, how is that going to affect nanotechnology? I'm going to say specifically, but also um, affect hardware development generally. Mm. <laughs> well, I think we already have like a like we're already on that as far as like with um, applying AI robotics and using like 3D optic and like we're already kind of like on that. Um, so I don't know if. I think right now what we can do is just continue is continually update it um, and continue to be with the times, but we're really fortunate that we're able to already be working within like a digital capacity. Right. I mean, you're already digitizing so many of your operations that. All right. So it seems like there's, there's, there's like a, a consensus here that we got to dig into the internship piece here. Uh, how does, what kinds of requirements, um, would make uh, somebody a, a, a strong candidate for an internship? Yeah, actually on our website itself, depending on the type of intern that they want to become or what department that they want to work for, all the requirements are on nanotronics.co. Um, they could go in there and see which one fits them. A lot of times just be a self-starter, be a team player, be responsible, um, have a, you know, will to want to learn um, and really just, you know, a problem solver, but we'll, we'll also help those to develop, you know. I'm yeah, guessing I this is somebody sorry. that has a good foundation for soft skills. So you don't, you don't even require folks to have kind of the technical know-how before they enter your, your shop, you teach them, is that? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing this is a little more nuanced and will kind of vary in position to position, but um, how does the intern schedule work? Are you able to manage school and the internship? Yeah, for sure. Um, a lot of times we're able to work with, usually it's, I believe it's like 20 hours, 20 to 35 hours per week, um, but we're totally flexible with the student. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, going back to interns, can you describe sort of um, what a day, a, a, an average day might be to uh, an average intern? So they'll come in. Um, a lot of times we do set like, OK, so initially we'll set up what your goals are um, and what you want for yourself. And then a lot of times we'll just fit you in the right you know, department that suits your talents and what your interests are. Um, and then from there, we'll continue to have a one on one meeting, just, you know, make sure that you're doing, you know, good in that field. Um, but a lot of times, also, you may be a liaison between departments. You may be running between, um, you know, engineering to QA, the R&D, the operations. Um, so it just, but that also gives you a chance to really feel for what you, you know, what you want to do in the company and what your strengths are and maybe what your weaknesses are and what you can work on. Right, so you learn a little bit of everything um, before you before you hone in on the specific space that you want to specialize yeah. in. And it may even be something like VR. You may be working on like a VR project or AR project. Um, a lot of times we had that too. Um, it just depends on, you know, what their strengths are. Uh, how long are the internships? Um, Normally, uh, it can be a semester, but sometimes like six months. And yeah, um, MD, uh, very Dominique said that very often a lot of their their current staff started as interns. So, depending on if you're if you're if you're good, it sounds like they will might offer you a job. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> 
Oh, wow. We got people um, <laughs> offering to work five times harder than everyone else. <laughs> That's uh, Please apply. Please apply. <laughs> I told you 190 jobs by 2026, so. There you go. They need to hire guys. Um, get those applications and go to our website. <laughs> uh, specifically, how are you using artificial intelligence in uh, your either your product or process development or in the actual manufacturing process? Do you want to? I mean, I can. <laughs> I mean, it's it's integrated in a lot of different well on our products lines in general um we can't really go into all the details on how it's integrated in there but i can tell you that our main product lines it, it, it's integrated inside of there and um more specifically to our individual customers so i guess that's one of, once again one of those things where you gotta you gotta be on the inside to really to really know <laughs> Um, so you said you're hiring, you just expanded this big, beautiful facility. Um, you said you're hiring up in a big way. Um, what do you anticipate for the future of Nanotronics other than, you know, hiring a bunch of the folks on this, uh, on this Zoom call? <laughs> I think we're just going to continue to grow, um, you know, continue to update our products, um, and just save some time. Um, team is really something to see. You know, we pride ourselves in, and the company culture is really big. So um, it's great that we're able to uh, hire that many people. Um, but we also work with a lot of different schools, so it's cool to be able to work with the students. Uh, we build, you know, curriculums, and we try to really incorporate that whole tech talent pipeline. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that's one of the things that we can look forward to. Cool. So it sounds, it looks like a lot of the the um, the questions are really focusing on this internship. And so it's your HR folks are going to be very busy in the coming days. Um, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, any last questions for uh, Team Nanotronics before we pivot? So we got one more. Uh, what can nanotechnology do for the medical field specifically? Well, um, I don't know if you guys see, but like they have this thing where like, uh, nanotech like they're putting it into like people's bodies and it's able to kind of see what is going on like what diseases you may have and automatically fix it um there's a lot of different ways if you guys just google it you can kind of see like how nanotechnology is affecting um every sector not just um healthcare um but yeah what we do is we're able to just see um on a nano scale like the defects and anomalies in manufacturing to kind of stop it before it's mass produced Fantastic. Um, I guess if anybody has additional questions, you can keep throwing them in the chat. But um, we're gonna we're gonna pivot over to uh, makerspace at this point. But I guess any last uh, comments uh, that you guys want to share, Dominique? Um, for me, I just say you know you're you may have a career idea of like what you want in your head, but it may completely change. Like. You know, um, I started off as a mass comm major. I went to school for mass communications and I'm here. So, you know, a lot of times it, your career trajectory, it just changes. Um, and just don't be afraid to follow it. Um, stay with the momentum and, you know, just try to be the best in whatever you guys try to do. That's it. <laughs> Cliche, but that's it. <laughs> you. <Yeah. Okay. laughs> Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you. Thank you both for, for joining today. Um, so yeah, as I said, it sounds like your HR uh, team is going to be busy. <laughs> we um, love it. We're looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, next up, I would love to invite Scott Van Campen from Makerspace NYC um to share a little bit scott if you could introduce makerspace kind of broadly while i tee up the 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 tour um and just share i think you know you saw a little bit about what's happening in advanced manufacturing makerspace really gets into the nitty-gritty to train folks in the number of machines there I, when i walk through is just astounding to me and what you're capable of doing there um in in, in that space is 
is blows my mind. So I'm, I'm glad that we'll, we're going to be able to share that with folks today. But yeah, if you could kick it off with um, just an introduction to Makerspace. Sure, uh, of course. Can everybody hear me all right? Okay, wonderful. Um, thank you, Neil and Corinne, for inviting me to join you guys today. So Makerspace NYC actually is a community-based nonprofit workshop. Uh, we got our start in Staten Island uh, as, uh, let's see, almost 10 years ago now. And uh, we started our, our Makerspace after my sculptural and architectural metalworking business was flooded in Hurricane Sandy. So we had about three and a half feet of salt water come through my shop. And it, it, of course, a metal shop, everything is really heavy and nothing floats. Uh, so we had we had some damage, but really, you know, we saw it coming, and we we picked our welders up on the on the uh, cranes and picked up all the tools off the floor that we could, uh, the ones that weren't too heavy, uh, and we were able after Sandy to go through the process of cleaning and, and rebuilding the equipment. Uh, very few pieces of equipment that I actually had to throw out because uh, we have the the technology to to fix things, and uh, during the the cleanup of that. My wife and I had thrown around uh, the idea of starting a makerspace. I'd been uh, familiar with the makerspace movement. I had uh, had a piece of sculpture that we showed at Maker Fair out in Long in uh, Palo Science out in Queens, and uh, we we were throwing around this idea of like if we could if we could open up our space because we had a lot of tools and share those tools with people and teach them how to use those tools, we can encourage them to start businesses with that equipment. So we partnered with the New York City Economic Development Corporation and uh, we were awarded a grant to start this business as a maker space. And we started in Staten Island. We still have our space in Staten Island. It's a 6,000 square foot uh, community workshop. We have uh, metalworking and woodworking, CNC router, CNC machining, uh, and then some studio spaces for our members. We have a ceramic studio. We also have a radio station called makerparkradio.nyc. And so we, we, we were at that location and doing all kinds of cool things. And we took over a lot across the street and uh, it was basically a, a, a dumping area. There were a bunch of abandoned cars and that sort of thing. We talked to the city and we partnered with the city again to take over that piece of property to build Maker Park. And that's where our radio station got the start. So they're called makerparkradio.nyc. And we, they have now about 120 DJs. They do all kinds of music from hip hop to Latin to classic rock to punk rock to classical. It, it's really just amazing. And uh, so, you know, we've, we've really built this very unique vibrant community of people that want to make stuff. And, you know, music's part of that, uh, physical making, welding, woodworking, all of those things come together. Uh, we've helped people start businesses in the space. We've had four or five patents come out of the space, which is pretty amazing. Um, and a few years ago, we had the opportunity to take over a space at the Brooklyn Army Terminal. And uh, this was a space that was set up as uh, basically a maker space. Uh, it was set up by a company that had some issues. They went out of business just after they set up the, uh, the space. And we worked with the city. We, we submitted a proposal. We competed with other businesses. Uh, but eventually after some negotiations, we now lease a space here at the Brooklyn Army Terminal. And we lease the equipment in the space. We have a million dollars worth of tools. Uh, we have laser cutters, and this is the, the tour that you guys are going to see here in just a minute uh, is a walkthrough of the space, the tools that we have, um, and, uh, you know, we can, I guess we could start with the tour of this space, and I'm happy to answer any questions and then tell you about our expansions that we're working on right now uh, that are very exciting for us. Uh, so let's, let's watch this quick video uh, of me kind of walking through the space talking about stuff. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks, Scott. Um, let me know if you can or cannot hear this once I press play. Hi, everybody. My name is Scott Van Campen. I'm executive director and co-founder here at Makerspace NYC. We are a community-based nonprofit workshop where we teach people how to use tools and encourage them to start businesses with the tools that we have. So let's come on in and take a look. 
So when we first walk into the maker space, we have a couple of classrooms here and as part of our mission, we share knowledge, right? So that includes uh, programming and classes for K through 12 groups, as well as adult ed um, and workforce development stuff, right? Okay. We have our computer bank here where members can come in and utilize the computers. Uh, we have Fusion 360, SolidWorks, and uh, you know many members work on their projects here. We also use this for educational purposes. And across from that, we have four 60 watt, 18 by 24 inch lasers here. Uh, our lasers, right, are suitable for cutting wood, leather, plastics, acrylic, uh, sheet materials like that. And uh, you know we took this piece here. This is a sort of a drop uh, sort of shape of a bowl. This was all cut out of uh, eighth inch plywood on our laser cutter here. So this is totally one piece on the top here. And the legs were one piece that slid together to make a three dimensional object. And right over here is our soft goods and sewing textile areas. We have multiple sewing machines. Uh, beginning sewing machines, some professional machines. Uh, we have a walking foot and a straight stitch and a serger for those who are in the fabric industry. Uh, you can really you can make anything. You can make jeans, you can make sweatshirts. Uh, we've had some pretty amazing set design pieces uh, for the theater that were made in here uh, by one of our members. Uh, we also have the ability to do silk screening, vinyl cutting, uh, and this machine right here, this is a 10 color embroidery machine. So this jellyfish was done on this machine and then we mounted it on a board. So it's actually done just on fabric. Um, and this was one file. This was all embroidered with this machine. It took about 25 or 30 minutes for the whole thing to be done but we were using CNC technology, right? So CNC stands for computer numerical control. And it's basically telling uh, the machine, the computer's telling the machine where to stitch to make whatever design we're looking to make. Okay. So this is our 3D printing area. We have multiple 3D printers. We have some Ultimaker 3s as well as some Prusas, uh, some MakerBots. And uh, when we're talking about 3D printing, we're using that same CNC technology to, uh, you know, it's, it's a machine that is controlled by a computer and it's a coordinate based system. So we're telling the nozzle exactly where to move and the table here comes up to the nozzle and the nozzle, it's sort of like a computer controlled hot glue gun. It will lay down a layer of plastic and then the table lowers by a set dimension, usually like 0.1 millimeters, and it'll do another layer and trace the same lines that it's, it's been going over to create a 3D object in layers. So we have software that does all that writing of the code for us and we're actually exporting a G code, which is a text document full of measurements telling the machine exactly where to move as it's making our object. Okay, so this is our machining room. Uh, within this space, we have lathes and milling machines. The, the lathe and the milling machine were the backbone of the American Industrial Revolution. So these two machines, we can make in, in the metal and working industry, we can make just about anything you can imagine, right? From, from simple things like wrenches to uh, axles for engines. We can build an entire engine with these two machines. So these thousandth of an inch uh, as far as tolerance when we're, when we're shaping material and pretty much you give me enough time and material, I could probably make this machine on this machine. The makerspace here 
folks come in and they sign up for membership and if they don't know how to use tools, we help them use these tools. Uh, many of the folks here, once they know how to use those tools, start projects and work on projects either for themselves or for uh, gifts or for products or start businesses within, within this. Uh, my background in particular is in welding and fabricating, so this is definitely my happy place. We have MIG welding, TIG welding, stick welding, as well as we have one plasma cutter here. Back here, this is all metalworking equipment. So we have the ability for things like hand shears, an English wheel for uh, bending and shaping uh, sheet metal. We have an iron worker that is a hydraulic control machine. This has uh, 55 tons of capacity, and all it does is cut steel bars or metal bars, and uh, it can also punch holes. Uh, several grinding stations, we have a knife grinder, uh, we have an anvil, we have an induction forge. So we don't currently have a gas forge, we have a induction forge which uses high intensity uh, electricity, about 15,000 volts that circulate through this coil here and as we put a steel bar in here, I can heat up a three quarter inch square bar in about 45 seconds to forging temperatures. Should we try? Okay, good. All right, so this is a three, quarter, a three eighths by three eighths square bar. Uh, it has a tensile strength of about 55,000 pounds. It's pretty stiff. Uh, what I'm going to do is just take this bar, I'm going to put it in our induction forge and we're going to start flowing some electricity around this and you can see how quickly it's exciting those particles in the steel and it makes it red hot for 12 seconds and I can literally at this point I can start forging that and you see I'm holding this with my bare hands. That heat is so focused on there. Right? We only heated that area that was within that coil. That electricity was flowing around and creates an electromagnetic force field in the steel that starts moving the particles around, makes them very hot very quickly. Kind of cool. So this machine, this is sort of the last on the, on the tour as we've gone through our shops here. Uh, this is a water jet cutter. This is a Flow 1313B, and it has the capacity to cut through any material up to four feet wide by four feet wide by eight inches thick. And so the way this machine works, this is a water jet cutter, and we have our head of the water jet uh, sends out water that's compressed to 55,000 PSI in a water stream that is less than a sixteenth of an inch in diameter. And if you take a, a just a quick look at these fins, these are a sacrificial surface. So we put, put our material right on top of here. And as we cut through our material, we're actually cutting into these fins. So they get sort of chewed up and you can see the very thin kerf there but that water moves around and cuts through our material. All the water that's underneath here, there's about three feet of a water underneath here, is used to disperse the intensity of the water jet as it's traveling downward. If we didn't have a bed of water here to break up that stream of water, it would actually cut through itself. Um, oh, and I forgot to mention, right before the water leaves the nozzle, there is, uh, we're adding garnet powder to the uh, water stream, and that garnet actually acts as an abrasive to cut through the material, and it's, it's much more like eroding, so sort of like how the Grand Canyon was made with water and sand kind of wearing down the landscape. This is using high pressure with a little bit of abrasive grit to it to cut through material. All right, so that's kind of like showing you guys a whole bunch of the tools and equipment that we have here at the Makerspace. 
Moving forward, we're really looking forward to uh, supporting small businesses, entrepreneurs, artists, uh, folks like you guys that want to learn how to, how to make something. Uh, I really encourage you, get out there, get your hands dirty, because uh, at the end of the day, there's nothing better than saying I made that. Okay, so that's our tour. A uh, little glitchy on the sound. My apologies there. Um, we we make things. We don't make a lot of videos. <laughs> that's that's amazing, Scott. Um, thank you for this. And actually, I sorry, I should have done this when we when we kicked it off. But if everyone um, could just throw in the chat, well, questions of course. Those are always welcome. Um, but also just throw in the chat uh, what program you're in in school and whether you're familiar with with machines and 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 products and technologies like these. Um, but let's just go. Oh, we got a couple questions coming through. Uh, Scott, what sort of safety equipment would you need to handle metalworking, welding, or frankly just being around the material, the machine, the machinery? Right. So uh, safety is like. You know, it may sound a little cliche, but that's first, last, and always, right? Um, so when when we're welding, uh, we're working with an arc of electricity that is so intense, it's brighter than the sun, and it's super hot. Uh, so we have special welding masks for that. We have gloves and leathers, and everybody's required to wear work boots and jeans, right? No open-toed shoes. We don't want anybody getting hurt. Uh, when we're working with our plasma cutter, we are working with an arc of electricity at 42,000 degrees. Again, hotter than the sun. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, we're ionizing particles that are traveling 1,000 miles per hour. So uh, anytime people are working around our equipment, they need to be trained uh, for safety and, and use. They need to know what they're doing so that they don't get hurt and the machines don't get hurt. And, uh, you know, we do that training. So we, we share that knowledge with people uh, and uh, really that's, that's part of the thing, right? If, you're, if you want to get into doing hands-on projects, learn the safety on those tools before you do anything else. Absolutely, safety first in all situations. Um, yeah, there are a couple of follow-up questions about whether injuries often um, if that happens, uh, how long does it usually take to become comfortable with this equipment? Because it's, yeah, even, you know, first time I was there, I was intimidated. <laughs> um, but yeah, and, you know, we, we want people to be comfortable and that, that, comes, that comes with knowledge, right? Understanding what you're doing, how you're doing it, uh, making sure that you're doing it safely, thinking that through, um, you know, the... Uh, I, I just saw a quick question about uh, negative impacts for uh, the environment with our equipment. Uh, we really don't have a lot of negative impacts. We do have waste uh, that we recycle. So we, we make sure that uh, anything that comes off our machines, we try to recycle. Uh, out of the wood shop, we, we save bits until they get too small. Um, the all of our metal gets recycled. We have big bins that we put all our steel and stainless steel and aluminum into, and that goes to a recycling facility. It gets remade into raw materials. Um, so yeah, you know, the, it's we we we're very aware of that. Yeah, yeah. It kind of blew my mind when you said on the tour that I can use this machine to make this machine. <laughs> Um, and I think that just that concept is is so powerful that like anything that we see in the world, even the most technically ad technologically advanced things, require skills like this and, and machines like this to to really comprise the com create the components and, and put them together. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, you guys look around the room that you're sitting in. Everything in this room was manufactured, right? Everything. The chairs, the walls, the the studs in the wall, the electrical components, the computer we're watching this on, or the phones, the you know the coffee cup, all of it was was manufactured by somebody. Uh, many of those tasks are automated nowadays, 
but they still have people that are overseeing those machines. Um, you know, there's there's still components on your iPhone that are hand assembled. You know, so it's there's still an integration between uh, advanced manufacturing techniques and human beings, right? It's not just all robots making it all. Yeah, I wanna I wanted to jump into that point um, that you you showed us a little bit with the three D printing and the commute com, the computer numerically controlled machining that effectively it is digital skills. I mean, you have to learn understand some of the math, you have to understand some of the physics, but it's effectively digital skills to program these machines to do the actual tooling. Um, and I guess how how do you how do you learn that process how much can somebody with just kind of basic typing and computer skills is that easy enough to to pivot to something like the digitally controlled um tools you have yeah i mean it, it certainly helps right being computer savvy savvy certainly helps having an understanding of drawing spaces and programs for creating cad files that can all be learned right you guys you can if you if you're intimidated by it of course, you can watch YouTube videos, you can download free software and just start playing with it, right? It's computer space, you're not gonna get hurt, right? You can, and all of the software that we use when we talk about making things nowadays, we can preview what the machine is going to do. So that's real important. And that's, that's true with uh, embroidery, that's true with 3D printing, CNC machining, all of those aspects. While I'm in computer space, I can say, well, this this part needs to look like this. Is it right? And I can I can watch the whole process happen before I actually go to my machine and potentially crash it or ruin my material or things along those lines, which we really do try to minimize. I mean, it's somewhat of expensive equipment. We don't want it, uh, you know, crashing. Um, and when we talk about coding, the the language that is that controls those machines is called G-code. And some of it's, I mean, it's a, it's a broad language, right? But all of those machines, although they might have something proprietary about how they're set up, right? So if I write machine uh, program for one machine, it doesn't necessarily relate to another machine, but all of that stuff happens in our software. So the, the heavy lift on the actual coding, like saying, I wanna move from, uh, 0. 0.00 on my X and Y to, you know, 0. 0.1 by 0. 0.5, you know, all of that. That's not, we're not coding that by hand, right? We're, we run it through some software and it spits out three or 400,000 lines of code. And then we send that to the machine and the machine will do all those parts. So you do need to understand what the machine's doing. You do need to prove it and look at it that and make sure that it's doing what you want. But a lot of the behind the scenes stuff it's kind of magic it's behind the curtain and uh you know you hit a couple buttons and you see if it works <laughs> scott and dominique i don't know if you're um the head of manufacturing that was with you has, has left already but i'd love for him to weigh in too but scott you mentioned you started off as um as a welder which i'm assuming and correct me if i'm wrong has a, has a narrower scope of of expertise than all these <laughs> all these machines how did you how did you get to learn about um, how to work all these machines? And um, was was the the technical knowledge that you had built as a welder, was it applicable to the others? Or was there kind of a learning curve even for you? Well, of course there was a learning curve, right? But I had the luck of going to art school. And that's where I learned how to weld. And I, I found I had a knack for it. I was very good at it. Um, and so I, I, I started picking up welding jobs and started getting into things and started utilizing advanced manufacturing techniques like CNC routing, uh, water jet cutting, laser cutting uh, in my business. And, you know, so because it was my business and because it was for me, I had to learn all of that on my own. And that was you know, research that was reading up on things, getting books and, and asking questions, right? Finding people in the industry and, and chewing their ear off. Like, how does this work? Why is this? What's that? And that's how I, I learned a lot of the things that I've uh, been, you know, 
that I, it's, it's basically, I would say self-taught. And that was pre-YouTube, that was pre-Google, uh, right? I've been a welder for about 32 years, 33 years now. Very passionate about it. I think everybody should know how to weld. Really, should put it on your bucket list. Uh, it's super empowering uh, to be able to ma manipulate such strong materials. But, you know, over the years with uh, YouTube and Google, it really has lowered the bar for gaining interest, gaining the bare minimum, like understanding concepts is so much easier and so much more accessible that, you know, you, you, you can get excited about something and have an understanding before you actually put your hands on the tools. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. And sorry, Dominic, did your colleague uh, join us? Yeah, Gabe is back. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Gabe. Uh, my question was more about your career evolution and how did you did it? Did you start off in one the use of one machine before you you learned kind of the, the gambit of it and and uh, how did you do that? <laughs> um, I actually I have kind of a little different type of background. Um, my dad was a machinist, and so I've been operating a machine shop since I was like eight years old. Um, so it was like mostly but that was all manual machining. Um, I was self-taught on CNC and kind of went from there. And then I went to school after I was already running and operating for about eight years before I finally went to get a formal education on it. Sounds good. Thanks, Gabe. Um, sorry, before we wrap up on, on the makerspace section, well, there are a bunch of questions about how, how to actually engage Scott. How do folks become members? Uh, how do you do you need qualifications? Yeah, so we don't we don't really have qualifications other than you need to be over 18 to uh, use the equipment. Um, we can train you. We have classes in all the equipment that we use. And, uh, you know, some of some of the things are just basic safety and use classes. They're, they're maybe an hour, hour and a half long for like laser cutting or 3D printing. Um, and then we have more in-depth classes around CNC machining, welding, woodworking, uh, things along those lines. And, uh, you know, as a small nonprofit, we're here to support. We do uh, partner with organizations around running classes, teaching manufacturing. We partner with SBS and Neil here to uh, help implement uh, Apprentice NYC, uh, which is an advanced manufacturing uh, boot camp that's about 12 weeks long and uh, you know it's it's really an exciting time I think to be in manufacturing especially in New York City uh, where the city government and uh, local businesses actually support um, the, the the need for trained employees right so folks getting out of high school or you know looking to get into this uh, manufacturing career I, as Neil pointed out earlier there's a lot of jobs out there and you might you might try something in one field and be like well I don't know you know I, I kind of understand the machining side of it but I'm really good at measuring and I'm really good at the math side and so maybe you go into the you know the, the quality side you, you know check out and, and finish side of, of products uh, maybe you really like to get dirty maybe you really like making chips uh, maybe you're, you're into woodworking you know it's uh, one of the things that we afford is the opportunity to uh, access equipment and learn about it without um, try a bunch of different to, stuff without having to invest in, in yeah, even yeah. you don't have to put a two year stuff. career in it at a community college just be like yeah. I really don't like welding. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's you could come in a couple hours. You might be like, "Yeah, I'm done. I don't like that hot stuff." Yeah. Um, All right. Well, thank you so much, Scott. Um, actually, I'm going to use your last comment to pivot um, to this last section about Apprentice NYC for advanced manufacturing. Um, this is a year-long city-sponsored apprenticeship program that provides paid on-the-job training for entry-level manufacturing talent. Um, there's three phases to it. The first is a mandatory virtual uh, pre-apprenticeship for participants, um, and that is free for candidates. Phase two, if you're accepted to the program, if you're still interested and you're accepted, um, you get 400 hours of in-person hands-on training um, that Scott is, <laughs> has been facilitating, as you see him in uh, this picture here. 
And finally, um, there's another 1,500 hours of on-the-job training at your business site, uh, where you will technically be an employee of a business um, and learn while you get paid uh, on the job there. And apprentices in this program are gonna be trained in technologies and modalities like some of the ones that we saw today. Uh, laser cutting, computer numerically co controlled machining, metal map fabrication, 3D printing, additive manufacturing, welding, woodworking, blueprint reading, drawing, counting, all of it. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, please go ahead and sign up. Um, send us your, your contact information. And we'll be able to get details to you. Um, I'll, I'll see if I, I don't know if you can put that in the chat, Curran. Sorry, I've, I don't have it as a copyable uh, piece. But the application deadline for this coming cohort is going to be March 4th. Um, and we'll have a couple of information sessions about Apprentice NYC. Um, these are opportunities to learn these things, these technologies, learn these machines, learn these, these techniques, uh, work with companies like, um, like Nanotronics and, and, and spaces like Makerspace, um, and frankly, just learn while you earn um, and create you know, the, the future of, of manufacturing. So um, before I close out, I just want to say thank you again to Scott, Dominique, Gabe um, for, show, for, for welcoming us into your, your homes and, um, and showing us how, how exciting this, this sector really is and the brass techs of it. So with that, I will um, pass it on back to Corinne. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you, Scott. And I, I want to just apologize at the tail end here to say that I'm so sorry for calling you guys nanobiotics and not nanotronics. Um, I have a lot of balls in the air these days, so somehow that got uh, mixed up in my head. Um, thank you to all the students and the teachers for joining today. Um, I dropped an exit ticket into the chat. I'll drop it again. No big deal if you don't want to fill it out. Just nice to get some feedback on what you thought about today's event, but I could see throughout the um, presentations that you guys were clearly loving this, which is great. Um, I will be sending out a follow-up email uh, with the recording. And so you'll be able to see all of this information again. Um, and I will also upload this to our YouTube channel. And we also upload this to our public folders um, so that you can also see the chat if there were little bits in there that you wanna latch onto. Um, any last remarks? Um, oh, I just want to mention that we do have a lot of folks here who are in our engineering programs. Neil, I know you were asking about that earlier. Um, and they are learning things like CAD and Revit and a um, bunch of stuff. So I think hopefully um, some of them apply and hopefully they uh, get those internships that they were so eager for. Um, but yeah, do look out for those, for those students. Um, and thank you again for, for everything. This was amazing. I will certainly be following up with in-person tours if possible, with Dominique, um, maybe with Scott as well. Um, all right, thanks everybody. This was awesome. And uh, if you have any burning questions, I think uh, you guys all have my email, so feel free to email me. Fantastic. Thanks again. Thanks guys. Thank you, and apologize to your HR folks for uh, flooding them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's the good kind of problem, though. <laughs> They're going to love it, right? They're going to love yeah. it. <laughs> Thank you all. And we love to schedule a tour. So. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. I A lot of these schools are my colleagues in my colleague sector, so I'm going to touch base with him after this and, um, and connect. Um, but yeah, you guys tell me when's good for you. We can work, you know, around your schedule. So usually like Fridays are better. Um, so, okay. Yeah, usually Fridays are better. For okay, great. <laughs> and let me know if you guys have any requirements in terms of them showing up, anything they need to waivers um, or stuff I like think that. Like proof of um, proof of vaccination right now, uh, but I can send. I can forward. You yeah, the, just send me whatever you have. Yeah, that's fine. Great. Thank great. You again. Yeah, thank you. That was awesome. Have a great day. You too. Corinne, are we still recording? Oh yeah, let me stop. Oops, I always forget that. <laughs>